Ladies and gentlemen, I heard the other week someone say that the Vivek Ramaswamy surge is over, but I gotta say, I've checked the last few polls. It does not look as if this surge is over. Some polls have him at around 10%. I saw one poll by Fox News that had him at 11% nationally. The real clear politics average now has him in a clear third place at a little bit above 7%. As far as the national polls are concerned, he's really the only one who continues to be rising while DeSantis is falling and Trump is staying the same. Well, on the point, Vivek went on Jordan Peterson's podcast a few days ago to have, I think, what was their second lengthy conversation. We're not going to be able to get to all of this because it is an hour and 40 minutes and this video would be two hours if I were to do the entire thing, but we'll get to some key moments. I'll provide my thoughts as we go along. And one last thing, one last thing. In my Oliver Anthony reaction video, where I did a horrible job of introducing my plan, not the government's plan, of offering psychedelic-assisted therapy for compensation, uh, people were bringing up in the comment section that they were grateful that they were able to get the perspective from a certified soy boy. So I thought today, in honor of this great acclaim, uh, I would bring some tofu into the scene. We're going to have it here for moral support, just to sort of acknowledge the soy presence. And without further ado, let's get into this one. The advice they give me is to dumb it down, mm -hmm. that this is no longer the era of writing books. As you know, I mean, you've written more prolifically than I have, but the last few years I've been in a stage of life where I've been writing books, examining issues with depth. I think the, the threats to liberty are complex and I've been explaining them. And so what they said is, when you need to get used to the political mindset People don't have that kind of attention span. They need to be distilled into bullet points, dumb it down when you need to, or nobody's going to listen to you. What I have found is that I have been at my worst when I'm doing that, and I've been at my best when I'm more or less ignoring that advice. And that's less about me, Dr. Peterson. That's actually deeply encouraging about the voter base in this country. I'm talking to voters that go beyond the traditional Republican primary base, but everything that I'm saying here applies to the traditional Republican primary base as well. I think that our voters today are hungry for depth, actually, in a way that they may have never been. And why do I say they may have never been? Well, I mean, these political consultants are getting their conventional wisdom from somewhere. I assume it's from past experience and not just raw stupidity. Uh, I think that they must be judging from prior eras. And at least you, you, today, you, you I will put give you my finger. sense. There are so many options in terms of media viewership today that did not exist in the past. The traditional news media, the teleprompter form of media where people were just reading scripts, has lost significant appeal because it doesn't seem authentic. I ran into this myself. People want that conversation. And people don't want to feel like you're talking down to them. This is one of the things that I love about Vivek. He doesn't try to politically maneuver his way as much as I've seen other politicians. There's that famous clip of Chris Christie questioning Marco Rubio as he's going into his very traditional Republican talking points on the debate stage. And Chris Christie was like, look at that, it's the Marco bot over here. Just going through the motions. I would add this, let's dispel with this fiction that Barack Obama doesn't know what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. That's what Washington DC does. The drive-by shot at the beginning with incorrect and incomplete information, and then the memorized 25 second speech that is exactly what his <laughs> advisors gave him. See, Those are the facts. Here's the bottom line. This notion that Barack Obama doesn't know what he's doing is just not there true. There it is. He knows exactly what he's doing. There it is, the memorized doing. 25 second speech. But I am pleasantly surprised with how much Vivek is rising. Um, because, I, you know, I'm going to be honest, as a liberal and someone who came from a position where I was further left in 2016 and I had more negative feelings toward Republican voters, a lot of what I thought was that, you know, Republican voters are stupid. I'm going to be honest. That was my thinking at the time. And over time, I've come to hold what I think is a more nuanced position. But there is still that old instinct uh, that, that lives within me that is somewhat surprised that someone as articulate as Vivek is doing as well at this point in the Republican primary as he is. I'm very encouraged by that. You know, one of the things we talked about the last time, you said that you weren't going to have someone else write your speeches. You said you weren't going to use yeah. a teleprompter. You were going to say what you thought. 
Now, this is what I've watched happen to a number of people that I know quite well. They get, they lack confidence in their own ability, in their own, their own, their own capacity to judge the political context. And they hire political consultants. And the political consultants claim to be political consultants. But my sense with political consultants is that they're like money managers. If they could manage money, they'd be rich. And if political consultants knew anything about politics, they'd be running themselves. And they always do the, say the same thing. They say just yeah. what you said, which is, well, people aren't very bright. They don't have a very long attention span. You have to dumb it down, which shows you exactly what they think of people. And it makes it you does. wonder, too, just exactly who Certainly they want does. to dumb down for. Like, it might be for the people, but it might be for them. And it's canned advice. And then you said, you know, that you found when you did that, that that's when you went astray and you fell off course. And that's what I've seen happen to the other people I've watched do this. And, you know, I don't dumb what I say down ever. Yeah, it's something that I love about Jordan Peterson is that he, he never dumbs the things that he says down. And in some cases, people who aren't accustomed to his very long streamed pattern based thinking, it seems as if he's just incoherently going from one point to the next. I'm going to do a video on Jordan Peterson's style of communication and his style of thinking, why it appeals to people and why certain people don't understand why it resonates so deeply within some of us. But one more thing I want to add here is that I have some background working with uh, elementary school age kids. And something that I would make a great emphasis to provide is speaking in a way that was a little bit above the level of the child and a little bit more sophisticated than the other adults interacting with them. You know, kids are smarter than we give them credit for. I think we unnecessarily dumb down our language when interacting with kids because we don't think they can handle it. My experience is that certain kids, especially, very much can. And it would behoove the intellectual mind of a budding teenager to start using language that suits that development. In a certain sense, it's easy to just blame the political consultants, but they may be playing to the medium of communication. Yeah, yeah, yeah so, absolutely. So they, they produce 30 second TV ads. That is what they do. Literally, you have to yeah. say it in 30 seconds. And the final one of those 30 seconds has to be paid for by, you know, X, Y, Z. So that is already where they begin. And even TV hits that are unpaid ads, and we haven't been doing very much TV paid ads at all. I, one of the things I'm learning is that actually is probably, certainly at this stage of the campaign, a horrendous waste of money. A absolutely, but, absolutely. I mean, it doesn't make any sense, but even the, even the three, four minute TV hits, it's a bastardized form of the truth. And, you know, I do think, especially in this moment we live in, the threats to liberty are complex. They do not present themselves in one bad guy and one good guy. In fact, I think one of the mistakes that the Republican Party makes, and I see this when I go to party events in particular, you know, there'll be a lot of signs that'll say, fire Biden, you know, and then the pledge that the Republican Party has asked people to sign is the called the beat to, to make it onto the debate stage, which I will sign as a condition for going on the debate stage, but it's called the beat Biden pledge. And it's so ridiculous reductionist, right? Like, you know, the, the entire party apparatus is focused on one man. Not because I have any great feelings about this man. I don't. I think he's an awful president. But the deeper point is he's barely the president. It's a managerial class that's actually pulling the strings. And we can get into the substance of that. I'm really glad that someone who is running for a political position in this country is bringing up how so much of political leadership is a team of individuals. I think a lot of folks have this conception of the President of the United States as if this person is doing everything. He has all of the responsibility. And then when you pair that conception with the character of Joe Biden and his cognitive limitations, you're thinking, what the hell? How could this guy possibly be running everything? Well, no, of course, he is part of a massive network of individuals, many of whom are responsible for making the very important decisions that require cognitive sufficiency. No way, no how in the most powerful country on planet Earth is that dude responsible for as much as the job description might imply. Time, and at a small event, maybe 50. In roomfuls of that size, people aren't falling for it, 
right? Th their eyes will glaze over. And, and then the questions I get from the grassroots audience base, I mean, they're like the questions I get from you. Very different from what I would get on cable television on a given night of the week. And so this is deeply encouraging that I think years, I think the last decade of the public knowing that they have been lied to, systematically lied to by the legacy media, I think has inculcated a deep sense of curiosity, intellectual curiosity, skepticism. You know, I think the mainstream media will now complain that that creates conspiracy theories. From the establishment perspective, and I think this is a valid concern to some degree, yes, when you start to question everything, there are going to be conspiracies that blossom out of that skepticism. Generally speaking, though, skeptical thinking is a good thing. The fact that we are not entirely taking for granted whatever is just being peddled to us by a prevailing narrative is a positive change in the skepticism of this country. The best thinkers are skeptical. Of course, the next step when it comes to considering conspiracies is to be skeptical of the conspiracy. And look, this takes a lot of time. Within our polarized political landscape, there is a right-wing side that is talking about certain issues and saying certain things on those issues. And then there's a left-wing side that's either talking about entirely different issues or saying exactly the opposite on certain shared issues. It's like, where is the truth in that? How do you actually find the truth? I mean, it is just, you are bombarded by information on a daily basis. And if you were to really investigate what is going on, this is a process that takes hours upon hours upon hours, challenging your biases, challenging everything that you think. And the impulse is to just follow your echo chamber. If you have a certain newscaster, a certain person who is telling you things, fall in line with your intuition. The easiest thing to do, and we all do this, is just, oh yeah, I like that guy, and I generally trust him, so I'm gonna continue to listen to that person. And that will make you knowledgeable in some ways, and, but you know, everyone has their own biases, they'll leave out a little bit of information here. I'll do the same thing. I'm branding myself as a liberal. I'm trying to approach these topics from a more balanced, neutral perspective, but I definitely have biases both in the left-wing direction and in the right-wing direction. And I'm gonna try to be as upfront about them as possible, but this stuff is hard. One of the big mistakes that I think legacy media has run into, or the big problems, I should say, is that it thought that it could fully encapsulate the truth on every issue. And to be honest, you can learn this from all of the great philosophers throughout history. That just isn't possible. You cannot have a consolidated form of all knowledge within a single body. It just, it doesn't exist. You need to consult different sources. Some of them may not be correct, but there's still the right spirit of being skeptical of what you're fed, such that individual people across this country, college degree or not, are asking some of the most intelligent questions I've heard, more intelligent questions about central bank digital currencies than I will get from my former colleagues on Wall Street. Mm. And college degree, completely irrelevant in many cases. There's this great common syllogism. Syllogism is like a, a chain. You have two premises and it leads to a conclusion. And there's a book. I'm going to grab it real quick. In this case, the example is all humans are mammals. Ryan Seacrest is a mammal. Therefore, Ryan Seacrest is human. Now, if you take each of these statements on their own, they're all true statements. However, the two premise statements do not actually logically lead to the conclusion. And 70% of university students get this problem wrong. They think that that is a valid argument. And it, it's called the fallacy of the undistributed middle. The point of all of that is to just say, whether you have a college degree or not, these universities, they're not teaching you critical thinking in the way that is necessary. This is a unique moment. And this is where I've, I've maybe, I wouldn't say shifted the messaging, I've discovered the core messaging of this campaign in the last three to four months. Kind of what was in my heart at the start, I'm now able to articulate. That's really nice. A really beautiful way of reframing this idea that's often chastised as political calculation. And I brought up in one of my previous reactions when Vivek said, I don't make political calculations. I'm like, you know, you do. But what he's describing there is this idea of how over time your audience does influence your messaging and you, you discover your messaging through the feedback that you're getting. 
because certain things aren't resonating with people and some things do resonate with people. In some cases, this is seen as a bad thing because when you're being influenced by other people, you aren't sticking true to your convictions. But I gotta tell you, as someone who just released a reaction video where it was just pure convictions and I didn't meet the audience that I was trying to relay the message to as well as I could, you gotta meet people where they're at. Or they're just not gonna understand what you're saying. They're also gonna think, Worse than that, that you're saying things that are intended to hurt them. That's a perfect way of describing it. And I think I'm trying to undergo the same process here on my own channel, looking to discover a message of sorts. It's beautiful. We live in a 1776 moment. That's what I think. It's like a moment of the American Revolution. That's what I feel in the air. Well, the other thing that's worth thinking about on the television front is that you don't want to underestimate the degree to which network TV and, and legacy media as such is really entertainment. And so yeah, part that's of actually... the... Well, that's exactly it. So, you know, so that yeah. it's politics as spectacle and part of what you're being called upon oh, so much theater to act out as a legacy media politician is the is politician as actor, right? You should be playing the part yeah. of the politician. And, and television, because it's primarily an entertainment medium, demands that. There is this mindset that starts to be instilled, like I've been chosen as a leader. And there is a there's an archetype, if we're using Jungian language, of what a leader should look like and how a leader should act. And you start to mold your behavior in some ways to how you think a leader should act, rather than just acting out who you are as an authentic person. There's a bit of character possession that takes place. I can't even imagine how intense that is for politicians. It probably just completely drags them around until they've lost their entire identity. In order to, quote unquote, drain the swamp, man, that's going to be a truly transformational leader that can execute something like that. And maybe it can't be done. Maybe Washington is too corrupt. Maybe the whole political landscape is in some sense, designed to be corrupt. I mean, co corruption isn't just constrained to this era. There's always been political corruption. It is within human nature. The Founding Fathers understood this, which is why they developed a system with a balance of powers, a federalist system that didn't consolidate power in the hands of one branch. For as flawed as everything is, that's what the system is designed to do. It's, it's designed to have checks on all of the potential flaws and corruption of the other branches. And for 200 plus years, it's worked reasonably well. We're in a new era right now. We're in an era where the founding fathers, they had, they had so many well-constructed ideas. They were so wise. But to truly predict the kind of informational deluge that has, has stricken us, the internet, there's no way to prepare for this kind of development. This might be one of the ways that a long-form podcast actually has an advantage over a book. You know... I think it's easier, I think you can think more deeply in a book, but I also think it's easier to deceive people because you can craft your lies in a book, but it's very difficult to craft your lies in a spontaneous conversation, yep. right? You get falseness Absolutely. of tone, you get awkwardness of body posture. You can tell when people are delivering a sound bite. You know, and I, I think part of the reason that people like Rogan and Lex Friedman's a good example too, Friedman, is that the reason that they're so popular is because they are genuine. The same thing is true with Russell Brand. You know, I mean, he's got more of a trickster shtick and he's a comedian, but of course, Rogan was a comedian too. But it's, and that is a form of disintermediated interaction. And I do think that it's, an, it's the antithesis of the crafted Hillary Clinton political class message. It's part of the reason that Donald Trump was also successful. Oh, yeah. And it is something that makes itself available to people like you, and Kennedy has been doing this very effectively too, who are using the new media. Pierre Polyev, the conservative leader in Canada, has also done a very good job of that. It's direct to voter communication. And I, I think your comments that the time is calling for that because people are tired of being manipulated by large, what, gigantic enterprises, corporate or government. I've been waiting for this, for a moment where it really is someone who harnesses the power of new media that ends up taking the whole thing. I mean, it's been several election cycles at this point. I voted for Andrew Yang last time out, and he was more so using these new media platforms. Bernie Sanders has been on Rogan a couple of times. Of course, a lot of the other politicians reach out to Rogan, and Rogan's like, no, not interviewing you. You're phony. 
think Elizabeth Warren reached out to Joe Rogan. I think Kamala Harris even reached out to Joe Rogan. Imagine how hilarious of an interview that would have been. My goodness. Talk about a divide in authenticity. But I, I do think there's a little bit of that traditional media that's it's got to be done. Reaching older voters especially. I mean, who watches Fox News and MSNBC and CNN at this point? It's mostly people who are much older. I certainly don't. Nobody in my generation does. People in Gen X don't even watch the mainstream news anymore. It's tough. We're definitely not completely done with that era yet. One of the things I've learned is I don't yet have a strong view on what the political snakes and ladders will be on mapping a path to victory. But actually, that might just be the path to victory. And I'm going to stick to that. And that's one of the things I've learned in this campaign. I've reviewed the empirical literature looking at campaign spending and its relationship to campaign success. And as far as I can tell, there's no relationship at all. I think part that's of what a, that's also encouraging. happens... <laughs> well, that's, I also think what happens is... That. That's especially true for incumbents, by the way. There's a small effect of advertising spending for challengers, but it's not very big, and it certainly doesn't justify the magnitude of spending. And I think part of what's also happened to the political consultant class is that Democrat and Republican alike, they've been in bed with the political advertisers. You did get to see that with someone like Michael Bloomberg who self-financed his campaign, he had billions of dollars to work with, one of the wealthiest people. Did Michael Bloomberg's message resonate within the Democratic primary for president? Not really. And it's because Democrats especially are not looking for some wealthy person. There's a significant bias against someone who is a billionaire leading the Democratic Party. Yeah, so, so many Democrats, they just voted for Joe Biden because they thought he was the only one who could beat Trump. It's so sad. That's that's where we're at. It's like, oh, yeah, I like this other guy, but we have to beat Donald Trump. So Joe Biden, I mean, there's just nothing inspiring about that at all. Jefferson yeah. and John Jay and Alexander Hamilton and James Madison say if they were walking the modern American terrain, if they were walking around in Washington, D.C. on a given day, rolling in their graves. what would they say? Would they be <laughs> pleased? Would they be proud? Would they be <laughs> appalled? I think today, in many respects, they would be appalled by what, what they see. No. And they, I think their intuitive understanding, that intuition is also part of what I'm reviving here because they're the guys who enshrined that intuition in the form of principles that are in a document known as our US Constitution today. And so for me, I think I share those intuitions. There's the intuitive side of me too, but my skill set is both as an entrepreneur and as somebody who understands principles, including legal principles. And those things don't usually go together. Now, we haven't talked about all the things that I'm awful at. Founding fathers were incredibly intelligent, well-read, wise men who understood that constructing a system that could withstand the pressure of different cultures and, and changing times. I was listening to an interview with Antonin Scalia, famous originalist Supreme Court justice. He lamented the fact that that level of genius does not seem to exist within American politics today uh, to the level that it did. It's like, you're not going to have a Thomas Jefferson and a James Madison roll around every single generation to lead a country. It's very unfortunate that we in this time period choose to recognize, especially on the left, all of the negative attributes of these characters. It's basically common knowledge at this point that Thomas Jefferson owned slaves and had a child with a slave. The name Sally Hemings is pretty much a common knowledge name. It's like, yeah, no, that should be taught in schools. Like when that is the emphasis that is taken and the contributions of these people are, are lost to history and you assume that, oh, we are more righteous in our efforts to revise everything, all of the ills of the past, because we have more knowledge now and we're superior humans now. It's the mistake that every generation makes. I also have listened to Vivek talk with Douglas Murray. Douglas Murray's work, including the War on the West, focuses on how we've, in Western civilization, been tearing down our heroes here in the West. Not everyone who's acted in an inappropriate way throughout history has had nothing to contribute. Just, just because someone made one mistake does not mean that you should ignore everything else that they say. I actually am pretty grateful to, um, I, I, am, I don't know that, I, I hope you don't mind me mentioning this, but the best piece of advice I got at the start of this campaign was just like very practical advice from Tucker Carlson, okay? Tucker told me, 
is just like very practical stuff. He said, travel with your family. Take your bubble that you live in with you, right? Because, you know, at some point you're going to show up on the road and you're just going to be floating in the ether and waking up in some hotel asking, okay, where am I? And I'm just floating and going through the motions. You're going to feel like that at some point in this campaign. And here's how you protect yourself against that. Whatever you have at home, just take it with you. Or when you don't take it with you, just make it a rule that you want to come back and spend as many nights at home sleeping in your own bed as possible. I came home at 11.30 last night. A few nights ago, it was 2 a.m. when I got back from Iowa. Oh, actually, where was it coming from? That was New Hampshire. Excuse me. <laughs> Lose track where I'm coming from. <laughs> but it's 2 a.m. But I still made a point to come. Talk about waking up and not knowing where you are. <laughs> a point to come back rather than to sleep the night over there because... Just as a very practical point, there's nothing philosophical about this. It grounds me. I wake up that next morning to the sound of my young son crying, and it, it annoys you at first for the first split second, and then it's just joy after that, which is like that's what you wake up to in the morning. <laughs> I think it. I think it continues to annoy you occasionally. I don't know. Depends on the day you're having. Depends on the morning. Maybe not. Maybe not. But um, parents out there. I'm not a parent yet. To people who have children, when your newborn wakes you up in the morning crying, are you immediately able to shift annoyance to joy? Is that something that happens instantaneously? Probably depends on the person too. My sense is people are guilty that things that they believe they should be grateful for actually end up annoying them. That's a more psychological point. Time where a moral error of one form or another is much more likely to occur. But if you're in constant communication with those embedded levels of responsibility, that also keeps you on track, right, in that, in that conservative manner that, that is part and parcel of secure sanity. And that's another advantage to adopting social responsibility, right, is you surround yourself with people who remind you to be sane. Yeah, because I don't know about other people, but I'm not a perfect person <laughs> or, or endowed with some sort of divine, you know, infallibility in the in the decisions that we make. And so we just put ourselves in a position to make the moral decision at every step through the structures that have it was, it's not I didn't invent this. My parents demonstrated it by example to me, and I suppose they didn't invent it. It's society's throughout human history in our, in our faith-based tradition. I mean, the Hindu way of life, just as the Judeo-Christian way of life, puts a great premium on this institution of the family. And so I think it actually comes down to just being that practical about it rather than to be overly abstract. It's like, you know, you and I talked about the bats in the cave, I think. You know, I, I, I certainly see us, see myself, all of us, I think my generation, maybe all of us as Americans, as human beings today, like blind bats, lost in a cave, right? And the bat. Are, are we rebranding <laughs> Plato's Republic at this point? <laughs> blind bats in a cave. It really does sound a lot like shadows on the wall of a cave. I guess Plato needs a rebranding. By the way, Plato, some evidence that part of his visionary philosophical exploration was brought about by psychedelic brews. Just saying. Just saying, one of the greatest philosophers throughout history. Psychedelics. It sends out an echolocation signal that bounces back off the wall, and then it comes back and it says, this is where I am. So if we human beings are doing the same thing, this is my family. That's true. That bounces back. It says, this is where I am. I believe in God. I'm a citizen of this nation. Those things come back and say, this is where I am. When those things disappear or they're distant... What happens? We send out these signals and then nothing comes back. And we're back in the desert. We're back to being the Israelites in the book of Exodus. We're back to being Americans in 2023. And, and so- Yeah, well, that's part means, of that problem of overemphasis on subjective self-identity. You know, right? like, this is a big, this is a terrible thing that the radicals on the left have done to people psychologically is to tell them, you are only what you claim to be. It's like, well- no, that's not true. You're what you've been able to negotiate with other people. And that's a damn good thing for you too, because as you pointed out about yourself, like isolated and alone, just there's lost. no indication at all that you we'd be other than, you know, maximally identity. sinful in the direction of our greatest weakness.
We need other people. And part of our identity is the ability to integrate ourselves with other people and to use them as signaling devices for our own orientation. As you pointed out, that's a deep cycle. When I made that reaction video the other day and I got all of that harsh feedback, some of it I didn't think came from a good place. It wasn't an accurate assessment of what I actually believe. But in some ways, I'm, I'm glad I got that response because that gave me an indication of what this message is up against. If, if I'm going to be able to advocate for these ideas that I do think can help certain people, not all people, then I'm going to need to continue to encounter criticism from people in the audience, perhaps people watching this right now. Criticism, push back to what you're saying, push back to who you are, is the negotiation of an identity. And it's so important. I know I come across as an elitist in many ways. And a lot of my activities that I enjoy, playing chess, reading, like these are introverted, withdrawn, isolated. I have friends who are like, yeah, you kind of belong in an ivory tower. In order to not totally be subsumed by that, you need to be challenged. You need to constantly have that, that social feedback. And, and hopefully over time, I'm able to hone a message, something that more people can believe in, because I believe in what I'm saying. If people are thinking that I'm some sort of AI bot who's broadcasting a message, that's not good. I want to change that. I think Ben Shapiro, I think by Ben fate. Shapiro, I don't think we would have found it. Shapiro told me that the Hebrew word for Eve means beneficial adversary. And it means optimized player. It means something like optimized player in a challenging yes. game. Right, so that's there what, is that. Yeah, Ben brought up this term, Ezra Konegdo, um, which means helper against him. And I think that's what we're about to get into right now, this important adversarial dynamic where the challenges that a partner inflicts upon you benefits your own ability to handle challenge itself. Anyway, let's get into it. That's the best description of it. That's the be that's exactly yeah. how it feels. You, yeah. you caught me in trying to I mean, try to describe it. I have a feeling it's hard to capture in words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just captured it in words. <laughs> that is it. And and it just it just actually raises another one of these kind of conservative values that's a little bit um, uncouth, maybe to talk about, or you're not supposed to. Talk, it's beyond the pale to talk about right now. But is just the importance of choosing who you marry and choosing very well, and almost the responsibility that I'm grateful that my parents, Apurva's parents, both exercised in, in making sure that they were, you know, filtering for making sure, understanding their kid probably better than anybody else. That's something that I think many parents abdicate today is to say that, oh, he's, well, I think he would find somebody more matched for him, but at least he's happy, or at least she's happy. And you're studying Exodus, but I, I, this might be this might be more of a Genesis example. I think it's probably late in the Book of Genesis when when Abraham sends his servant after he has his, has him put his hand under his thigh for the moment of commitment. That was just how they they made commitments back then. We don't put people's hands under their thighs now, but that was I think the biblical version of a, a, a solid commitment to say go back all the way over there to our homeland to find the proper spouse for my son Isaac, who was, he was the son that he was, God asked him to sacrifice. He didn't have to sacrifice. It was important to him to know that he went all the way there. And what if I come back empty handed? He said, I will not come, you will not come back empty handed. If you do, I will relieve you of your promise, but do not come back empty handed. And I do not want her, mar I don't want her marrying someone, you know, a Canaanite or something like this. So you know, he brings back Rebecca. And I think it's just a beautiful story of the importance of parental, some, it doesn't always have to be this way, but the spirit of it at least is, if it's not a parent, it's someone close to you. Maybe it's a best friend, but who really cares enough about you to say that maybe that's not the right person. And, and what I will tell you is in the period that Apoorva and I were dating, um, pragmatically, we knew we were going to get married, but we were waiting for her to finish medical school and by the pragmatism of, you know, all of that. If I was to do it again, we would have just gotten married sooner and just be done with it. We don't have to have a big ceremony about it. But we, we started in 2011. We got married in 2015. There wasn't one person who cared about either of us who would have looked and said, you know, maybe you want to take a step back and take it a little bit slower. But 
if the people around me who know me best, they would have stepped up, including and up to it, including my parents and family members and my brother and you know my best friends, they would have stepped up and said, hey, this isn't this isn't right. Why don't you, or, or, you know, are you sure you want to go this fast? Take it slow. Not a single person around me said it because they knew it was right. But I think it also just highlights the importance of, we could say we got lucky, but I think that actually it was the fabric around us, each of us right, that right, helped right, us right, get right. it right too. There seem to be these competing movements these days, this kind of red pill movement that says that men have lost power inside of relationships and that we live in this gynocentric society. And then there's the blue pill perspective that might be like men do a lot of bad things in relationships and women are usually the virtuous actors. And when a woman is unhappy, it, it means that it was the man's fault and happy wife, happy life. The blue pill perspective just completely ignores like biological imperatives that exist between men and women. And the red pill perspective, it focuses on it so much that you completely lose that, that, that collaborative dynamic of a relationship. At the end of the day, there is no one sex that has moral superiority over the other. That just doesn't exist. And I think what the red pill and blue pill, if I'm being really crude about describing these, represent is viewing men and women as possessing different degrees of, of moral agency. It's like, that's, that's not how a relationship is going to thrive. I think we should probably stop it here. Still have around 13 minutes left of the interview, but I've spoken a lot. We've heard these brilliant minds speak a lot. If you're enjoying this kind of commentary, this three-way conversation that might take place if we're listening to an interview, definitely like and subscribe. More of this to come. I'm going to be doing a, a debate later this week and doing more debate-like analysis that I was doing in some of my earlier videos. So stay tuned for that. I have to go finish my tofu. Take care.